This is Project William Tell, the story of the Air Force's most realistic weapons need. In the words of General Curtis E. LeMay, Project William Tell is more than the interceptor phase of the 6th United States Air Force Worldwide Weapons Meet. It is a major test of our ability to stop an air attack launched against this country. Survival may depend upon the skills of the men who man the weapons of the Air Defense Command. Project William Tell is the most realistic proving ground, short of actual combat conditions, that we can provide to evaluate these capabilities. The mission of Project William Tell is threefold. First, to demonstrate the capability of our fighter interceptor weapon system. Then, to demonstrate the capability and proficiency of the fighter interceptor flight crews. And finally, to demonstrate the effectiveness and reliability of a high-speed, high-altitude drone target system. Ground and airborne television cameras will bring a graphic blow-by-blow -blow presentation of the operation to this television monitor room. And for the first time in weapons meet history, through the magic of television, you will fly wing and wing with the airborne adversaries as they write Air Force history in the Florida skies. The logical host for such a competition is the 73rd Air Division, located here at Pennell Air Force Base, Florida. This division is generally responsible for development and conduct of all Air Defense Command tactical exercise and evaluation programs. As organized, this weapons employment complex provides the expanded facilities and tactical realism required for the worldwide fighter interceptor competition. To provide adequate range and to permit positive control of the drone targets, it has been decided that the target flight will be in a racetrack pattern. This racetrack will be approximately 130 miles in length and will be oriented in an east and west direction. All firing passes are to be made against the target on a heading from north to south. This will ensure that the impact area south of the track falls in the open area of the Gulf. The drone control station at Apalachicola, Florida, is in close proximity to a north-south line bisecting the racetrack pattern and approximately 30 miles north of the racetrack pattern. This assures adequate control of the target throughout the entire range. The water recovery area is adjacent to St. George Island. The targets are flown to this predetermined area after mission completion to permit immediate parachute recovery to recondition the target for reuse and to implement the evaluation of the camera scoring film. We are now at Tyndall Air Force Base, Panama City, Florida, scene of the fighter interceptor phase of the weapons meet. Here with the planes they fly are gathered those squadrons whose hairline level of superiority has named them best in the Air Force. First all-weather supersonic interceptor for the Air Force, the Convair F-102, is the primary aircraft of America's continental air defense system. Crammed with electronic gear, the F-102 climbs like a rocket, seeks out enemy aircraft, locks on the target, then automatically unleashes its deadly Hughes Falcon missiles. This Delta Dagger is powered by a Platt & Whitney J-57 turbojet with afterburner. The justly famous Sabrejet F-86L, built by North American Aviation, a bigger and more deadly fighter than those F-86s which ruled Korean skies. It is powered by a General Electric J-47 turbojet with afterburner. Armament consists of 24 2.75 rockets, each packing the punch of a 75 millimeter artillery shell. The hard-hitting Northrop F-89J Scorpion, powered by two Allison J-35 turbojet engines with afterburners and armed with Douglas MA-1 Genie rockets. All these constitute a truly lethal group of weapons. Successful 20th century fighter interceptor crews find teamwork more essential than any other single capability. For teamwork is the inseparable ally of time, and time is a most vital element in the long-range air defense of our nation. The Air Force Fighter Interceptor Team is composed of the airframe and engine mechanic, 
the armament specialist, the radar operator, the fire control specialist, the ground control intercept director, and the man in the manned missile, the pilot. Twelve such teams are on the line waiting to go. Heraldic devices on the contesting planes proudly proclaim squadron identity. The F-102s of the 318th from McCord have the circles with superimposed angles. A circle, triangle, and 102 outline symbolizes the 326th of Richard's Gabawa. The red-tailed 317th is from Alaska. The Eagle carrying a Falcon missile is the 482nd from Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. Here are the F-86s with the checkered tails of the 4th Fighter Interceptors from Japan. The horizontal band marks the 3,555th flying training wing of Perrin. The yellow tail slashed with black lightning is the 322nd from Larson. White lightning on a band of blue identifies the 125th Fighter Group Air National Guard from Jacksonville. The knight brandishing a thunderbolt is the 526th from Germany. The F-89s with shield of red and blue carrying the motto, Above the Foe, are the 84th from Hamilton. Malmstrom's 29th has a fighting cock on a red background. The eagle holding a thunderbolt against a yellow background is the 465th from Griffiths Air Force Base, New York. Matched against this array, the 4756th Drone Squadron has provided 98 Ryan Q2A Fire B drones, the only operational target system capable of realistically simulating attack by first-line enemy aircraft. Another team not so apparent and of prime importance, not only to this meet but to national security, is the industrial team that put all this hardware into the hands of the men who use it. Northrop, Douglas, North American, Aerojet, Parsons, Trade, Convair, Hughes, and Ryan. These important industrial teams have coordinated their efforts to produce these weapon systems of the Air Force, the targets and the scoring equipment to evaluate total effectiveness. The day is past when aircraft and armament are helter-skelter arrangements improvised to suit immediate requirements. The vastly complex weapon systems of today are carefully planned to meet predicted situations, providing a weapon, an electronic launching system, and a supersonic weapon platform matched against known capabilities of a potential aggressor. These weapon systems would not be in existence today without the cooperation, concentrated engineering know-how, precision mechanical skills, and teamwork of the aircraft industry, working in close liaison all combined to fulfill the requirements of the Air Force. The Q2A Fire Bee, produced to exacting Air Force standards, is in operational use at four USAF bases within the United States. Designed primarily as a target capable of simulating near-sonic enemy aircraft, the versatile Ryan Fire Bee is used for the proficiency training of air and ground crews and evaluation of weapon systems. Advanced auxiliary devices are continually being developed, including scoring devices and active augmentation systems, which will result in the Q2A being even more useful in the future training of our personnel and the evaluation of weapon systems. The target in William Tell configuration is equipped with special wingtip pods carrying Parami electronic scoring devices and trade cameras for visual scoring using motion picture film. For Parami electronic scoring, the in-flight Fire Bee emits a special radar signal which is picked up by the missile or rocket and returned to the Fire Bee at a higher frequency. This return signal modifies the transmission from the Fire Bee by pulsing in direct proportion to the distance between the missile and drone. 
The modified signals from the fire bee are then transmitted to the ground scoring station and recorded on moving tape. In this manner, an instant and accurate record of the missed distance of Genie rockets and Falcon missiles is obtained. Camera scoring is relatively simple. By measuring the visual image size of the 2.75 rocket on the film of the pod-mounted trade camera, it is possible to determine rocket to fire B distance for scoring purposes. At 5 a.m. on the morning of the 20th of October, 1958, the meet begins. The quiet of the morning is shattered as the B-26 launch plane loaded with two Q-2A fire bees coughs into life. In a few moments, it fades into the distance. You are riding today in the television chase plane. You will fly in visual contact with the enemy fire bee to mission altitude, then join up with the interceptors for the chase and perhaps the kill. You have a real front row seat for today's game. With all the help in the world, the search for this needle in its cloudy haystack takes a bit of doing once it's turned loose. When at 15,000 feet you finally sight the fire bee carrying B-26, you readily appreciate the interceptor's problem once the bird is launched. They will be traveling at over twice your speed and over twice your altitude. They are to search out and kill one of these fire bees, only one-fifteenth the size of enemy jet bombers. The compact fire bee has a wingspan of only 11 feet 2 inches, a length of 17 feet 4 inches, and is 5 feet 10 inches high. It is air launched from this B-26 launch plane, will fly at speeds in excess of 500 knots, has an altitude capability of 50,000 feet, and a flight duration of over one hour. Now the real business begins. Our mission is to stay in camera range of the fire bee from launch to mission altitude. As you fly wing to wing with a launch plane, its change in altitude and attitude tells you that the direct control operator in the B-26 is conducting pre-launch checkout of the target drone. He tests for roll, for pitch, for change of attitude. You see the aileron, elevators, and rudder momentarily reflect sunlight as right and left turn are signaled. The primary bird is found satisfactory, and direct controller now calls remote ground control and tells them that the primary bird has completed direct control checkout and is ready to start engine. Ground control answers, OK to start engine, and the Fire B drone is placed on internal power by the direct control operator. Ground control signals throttle check, and the launch plane reads out 85% power, 90%, 95%, 90%, 85%. As ground control beeps the throttle switch, then reverses beeps to reduce power. Parachute recovery circuitry is tested by ground control and verified by the launch plane, and the remote checkout is complete. We move into launch position as ground control commands launch in one minute at 94% RPM. Countdown begins. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, launch. The fire bee drops free as the launch plane banks steeply and streaks for home. As you try to keep your television camera on target, your TF-102 pilot closes with the Q-2A drone and begins a rapid-fire comment to ground control. Ground control, this is television chase. This looks like a good bird. It is straight and level. We're gaining altitude. We are passing through Angels 18. There is a slight turn to the right. We have leveled off. We are at Mach point 85, now at Angels 20. This is a good, steady bird. We have just passed through Angels 22. Now flight is straight and level. We are gaining altitude. We are at Angels 28. The bird is leveled off. 
flying straight and steady. We are gaining altitude now, up to Angels 29. Angels 30. Airspeed Mach 0.85. We are approaching mission altitude. I will now rendezvous with the interceptors. Break. We get out of there, leaving the Firebee alone, six miles up and 100 miles from Kindle. Now the realistic test of our air defense team gets underway at the air base. The ground control intercept director, already alert to a target launch, scans his long-range radar scope and spots the small drone target as it flashes across the range. He orders scramble. Determined pilots start their mission. Jets thunder down the runway. Firstly, in the abbreviated jargon of the Air Force, the director guides the pilots towards the interception. Compass direction, rate of climb, airspeed are constantly given and corrected. The director closely watches the closing angle of interception. In the cockpits, the pilots watch instruments, follow directions, make adjustments in control. They are busy. No time to scan the skies ahead. Their attention rivets on their own small world, the controls of these manned missiles. The interceptors streak along a precise path to a pinpoint rendezvous. The Hughes Aircraft Company's airborne armament control system takes over control of the interceptors. This airborne armament control system performs three overall functions in carrying out its mission. First, tied by radio link to the detection, warning, and control networks, the system directs its interceptors out to meet the target. Next, using radar, the system automatically searches for the target. Finally, when a particular pilot has identified his target, he locks on and attack begins. The system steers the interceptor to firing position, prepares the armament for firing, and at the correct time fires its guided missile or rockets, and the aircraft is turned back to the pilot. During the next few moments, this concentration of space engineering, supersonic weaponing, and human fortitude and skill explode across the sky in controlled savagery as the enemy target lances across the range and is hammered into tumbling, flaming wreckage or escapes. Mirrored in the trade cameras or etched on the speeding tape of the Parami electronic scoring equipment, this split second of hit or miss is recorded for scoring. During the next 10 days, conjecture becomes reality. A paper concept is welded into hard, hot facts as the MA-1 Genie rockets of the F-89 and the 2.75 rockets of the F-86s add their kill score to that of the Falcon from the 102s. Against the most realistic possible target, the aircraft and weapons of the Air Defense Command have proven their point. They are an accurate and deadly shield against invasion. When its mission is complete, unless the fire bee has sustained strike damage from a direct hit or near miss, the target is guided to the recovery area and parachute deployment is commanded by the ground controller. The parachute deployment sequence will also initiate automatically upon fuel depletion or loss of command control carrier. The ditched drone is usually recovered by an H-21 helicopter equipped with a fishpole boom tipped with a pelican hook. The hook is deftly swung into contact and engaged with a drone parachute riser. The boom is retracted. The H-21 flying banana swiftly returns the fire bee to Apalachicola. Under circumstances where helicopter recovery is inadvisable or impossible, a crash boat returns the drone to base for reuse. In these 10 days, the officers and men of the 4756th Drone Squadron put approximately 160 operational drones on the launch planes. 
Launch drones were in the air an average of 31 minutes for each of the 78 operational flights required to complete the competition schedule. Operational altitudes were from a minimum of 12,000 feet to a high of 41,000 feet. All flight schedules were met, a difficult feat under the grueling and exacting conditions of this realistic competition, a real tribute to the high morale and technical capabilities of the 4,756th Drone Squadron. Air defense is the ability to identify and destroy an attacker's weapons sufficiently far from populated areas of our continent to minimize the effect of lethal radioactive fallout released by nuclear blasts. The need for early detection, positive identification, and a maximum ratio of destruction at great range is stressed. The kill capability of any defense can be determined only when actually tested against targets that duplicate the speed, the altitude, and the evasive abilities of an enemy's weapon. At Project William Tell, the Ryan Firebee successfully provided the Air Force with such a realistic target for the very first time in any air defense competition. Other firsts established at Tyndall include first instance where the ground controller pilot team competed as a single unit. First use of Parami electronic scoring. First use of airborne camera scoring in competition. First use of the primary ADC interceptor, the Convair F-102 in competition. First use of the Hughes GAR-1 Falcon guided missile in competition. First competition supersonic firing in a weapons meet. First weapons meet held under rules simulating actual combat condition. Against near-sonic fire B targets, the nation's interceptor team scored a phenomenal hit ratio of almost 90% on initial defense engagements. This was a sharp contrast to the Air Force estimate made only a few years ago, at which time General Hoyt Vandenberg, then Chief of Staff, predicted at least two-thirds of an enemy's attacking bombers could easily penetrate our defenses. America must continuously produce interceptors with longer range, more speed, greater altitude, to give the all-important ability to intercept and destroy an enemy many hundreds of miles from its intended target. Scientists presently estimate that a thermonuclear blast would cover an area of five to seven hundred square miles. But of more importance, that radioactive fallout would destroy not only much of our population, but the productive capability of our land for 15 to 20 years. Tomorrow's offense against our country would be with still more lethal weapons and weapon systems. To counter this threat, the Air Defense Command is increasing its arsenal of weapon systems. The speedy high-altitude F-104 Starfighter by Lockheed. The fast two-engine long-range F-101 Voodoo by McDonnell. The F-106 Delta Dart by Convair with its increased performance and versatile electronic equipment are the newest supersonic interceptors that will, in the near future, provide the nation with its long-range shield against invasion. In the offing are other manned interceptors, notably the North American F-108, designed as super-altitude, ultra-fast, mobile missile launching platforms that can detect and destroy an enemy weapon far to the north or out at sea. It is such weapons flying above 70,000 feet at speeds above 2,000 miles per hour that will permit destruction of invaders in the Arctic area and give the nation a truly long-range defense capability. With the advent of performances that double or triple the speed of sound, there arises a need for targets that can match enemy speeds. Defense advisors cite the need for consolidating airframe, engine, search radar, fire control system, and target requirements of each weapon system to provide positive assurance that our air defense capability is actual, not merely theoretical. Just as the Ryan Firebee Q2A provided the first realistic target for today's interceptors, so must tomorrow's interceptors be provided with a target that will test adequately the accuracy and adequacy of the entire weapon system. Racing toward its place in the training and evaluation program of tomorrow's fighter interceptors is the Q2C Firebee, a faster, higher altitude, longer range, more evasive target. It is designed to meet the challenge of these new planes, these new weapon systems, and alert Air Force teams. 
In addition to electronic and photographic scoring systems, plans for the Q2C provide for electronic countermeasure capabilities, presenting even more realistically the evasive and escape potentialities of modern enemy jet aircraft. Project William Tell is history, grand history, vital to our defense planning. Our squadrons are scattered once again to the four points of the compass and the four corners of the world. However, throughout the nation and across the Arctic, day and night, in sunshine and storm, in the vast loneliness of the stratosphere, the Air Defense Command is fully operational as its interceptors streak the skies to challenge and identify any unknown aircraft that could possibly menace the North American continent. war is thrust upon us, it is the United States Air Force Air Defense Command that must and will provide the long-range defense, the far-reaching shield against invasion that will protect our country from obliteration. We are ready.